welcome to the next uh, the next panel. We have we have three speakers um, uh, taking part in this panel, um, and I'd like to introduce the first uh, speaker, who is Logan Sisley, who um, is originally from New Zealand, but he's been living in Ireland since 2007, or maybe even before that. But he's exhibitions curator at the Hugh Lane Gallery. Uh, where he's now acting head of collections and um, he is a, a formidable researcher and art historian and curator and he's done wonderful work in the Hugh Lane Gallery over, well, since he's got here. Um, most recently he curated the art of uh, negotiation, John Lavery's Anglo-Irish Treaty Portraits at the Embassy of Ireland um, in London in October, November. Uh, 2021, and he's co-curator with um, Edith Andreas of Studio and State, the Laveries and the Anglo-Irish Treaty um, at Collins Barracks, the National Museum of Ireland, the exhibition I was talking about earlier. And um, I'm delighted to welcome him here to talk about John Lavery's self-determination in the picturing of modern Irish history. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, thanks very much, Roisin. That's very kind, and thanks to the wonderful organisers too uh, for this for this um, uh, invitation and opportunity. So, um, really, uh, what I wanted to do was to reflect on those two exhibitions that um, Roisin mentioned. Um, so, in the Hewland Gallery, we have a group of uh, portraits that John Lavery painted in around 1920-21 of the signatories, both British and Irish, of the treaty between Britain and Ireland that was signed in 1921. Um, and I guess in, so we, we showed them in last year in, in London to mark the centenary of the treaty and uh, the exhibition that I co-curated with Edith Andres is currently on at the National Museum of Ireland uh, at Collins's Barracks until the 8th of January. And I guess um, there were kind of questions throughout, uh, I guess I was concerned with kind of getting the mechanics of, of what did Larry do? When did he do it? The, all of that kind of, the nuts and bolts down. Uh, and I wanted to reflect a little bit more on why he did this, um, and his kind of motivations for, uh, for painting these, and also a kind of a larger group of, um, of paintings of Irish subjects and Irish political subjects. So I called us, what do they call it? Um, John Larry's self-determination and picturing of, of modern Irish history. So I guess I was thinking, um, of a kind of speculative presentation on Lavery's personal motivations as an artist, um, in that th these portraits were not commissioned and that they were intended to be ultimately housed in a public collection in Ireland. Um, so I initially thought that these works kind of operated in contrast to his other very commercially successful work and fulfilled in him a desire for self-determination as an artist. Um, but I guess the more I think about this, I've sort of convinced myself otherwise of that, um, in that uh, I think it's consistent with his career and he always kind of managed his career very cannily uh, and, and cleverly on his own terms. Um, although to some extent they do operate uh, in a different way to some of his, his commissioned work. Um, as I mentioned, he gave them to Hugh Lane Gallery. He also gave a significant gift to the Ulster Museum. And um, in doing so, I think he was also very conscious of his legacy, aside from kind of um, lofty or alt altruistic sentiments that could be attached to that. So I was also thinking that it was also maybe self-promotion as, mu as much as self-determination, though that perhaps is a little, um, a little unkind. Very briefly, just for those who don't know, so there's just another shot of the exhibition at Collins' Barracks uh, with the, um, oh yeah, my tendency is always to point to the screen behind me, but it's here. Um, the, the, the portraits by Lavery uh, are shown alongside kind of archival and uh, object-based collections from the National Museum. So those who don't know John and also Hazel Lavery, uh, here are their portraits. John, very briefly, was born in Belfast in 1856, was orphaned at a young age and raised by relatives in Scotland, <laughs> studied in Glasgow, London, Paris, and established his career as, as part of what was known as the Glasgow Boys in uh, the 1880s in, in, in Glasgow. Um, and he exhibited an entrepreneurial spirit which continues throughout his career pretty early on, setting himself up as a kind of artist in residence at the Glasgow International Exhibition in 1888. 
which in turn led to a commission to paint Queen Victoria's visit. Uh, somewhat later, he moved to, this is very contracted, uh, moved to London, uh, set up his studio at Five Cromwell Place in South Kensington, and um, developed a career as a fashionable society portraitist, um, although he also painted interiors, landscapes, um, and other outdoor scenes. Uh, he was an official war artist in World War I, for which he was knighted, became Sir, Sir John Lavery. And uh, just an example of the kind of, I guess, the su success he enjoyed, this is um, his solo exhibition, The Solar Room, that it was accorded him at the Venice Biennale in uh, 1910. Um, so he was um, very much a very successful, but also very cosmopolitan, exhibited widely in Europe, part of a kind of a cosmopolitan liberal set, but at the same time very much embedded in the power or the networks of power, uh, of imperial power in London. Hazel, um, so Hazel on the left, they're painted by John, and John painted in 1921, around the same time as the treaty negotiations, in fact, uh, John painted by, by Hazel. So uh, she was also an artist, but born in Chicago in 1880. They first met in Brittany. Uh, she was engaged at the time, married, uh, her first husband died, and when she returned to Europe, they kind of reconnected and married in 1909. Um, and she was very important, I think, also in the story. I won't dwell too much on her today, but in terms of managing John's studio and managing um, the, the space in which, and the kind of the social space in which they, they operated. So, um, Larry's kind of Irish subject pictures then very quickly began around 1915. Uh, an, exam an earlier example, a kind of precedent for the treaty pictures, these portraits of John Redmond, the nationalist leader, and uh, Edward Carson, the unionist leader. And John was encouraged by Hazel's advice to, quote, bind up the contending forces in the bonds of holy paint. A slightly, very kind of optimistic idea, slightly naive perhaps, that by painting both sides of the kind of political equation that somehow um, some kind of harmony or, or, or peace could be found. Um, he followed with paintings, say, of, of Roger Casement's uh, appeal and then a series of works of uh, religious and political leaders in Northern Ireland. Um, and throughout, I mean, here he's painting kind of both sides, of, very kind of bluntly, of, of the political debate. And this idea of parity and kind of equivalence runs throughout um, his work, which, you know, could be pejoratively seen as fence-sitting, but I think it's, it's also kind of a, a smart way of negotiating very complex um, political and social kind of uh, context. So quickly, um, oh, so you've, we've seen this one already today, just another example of his political, his political works, The Blessing of the Colours there, which uh, was hung in a display uh, last year and earlier this year that I worked on with Neve McCann that Roisin Kennedy talked about a little bit earlier. So this is Lavery's studio in uh, Five Cromwell Place, and particularly during 1921, during the treaty negotiations, um, people from different uh, walks of life, social, political, cultural leaders could um, mix and mingle away from the kind of pressures of uh, more formal political negotiations. Elizabeth Countess of Fingal recalled the gatherings at Hazel's house, as she called it. Uh, she said she mixed her guests with gallant audacity. Michael Collins, Arthur Griffith met intimately men like Lord Birkenhead, Winston Churchill and Lord Londonderry and were able to talk things over in a friendly way as they could not have done elsewhere. And dinners were often held in John's studio. It's a huge space. You can see him sit seated um, at, the, at the fireplace for, for scale. And Edward Knobloch recalled that Lavery seemed always to have a brush in hand, despite the kind of the social um, uh, happenings in the space. And he quoted Cunningham Graham's description of Lavery's studio. The person who's being painted chats with her friends, doors close and open. A visitor has forgotten she left her husband sitting in a shop and screeches down the telephone. Sense, noise, confusion. Lavery sits painting on. He answers everyone with a smile, not in the least regarding what they say, and still the picture grows. And this is a kind of a picture, I think, of um, 
of someone who's very focused on his work and he, he often um, kind of disavows a kind of interest in some of the political uh, engagements that are taking place around him focused on um, completing the paintings. Um, I'll just quickly work through the paintings and I'll skip some of this. So De Valera, he painted uh, in during the truce, truce negotiations in, in July 1921, uh, and that's hung us alongside one of his uh, a study for his uh, a portrait commission of the royal family, which is in the Elton Museum uh, in the exhibition studio and state. And Lavery recalled that De Valera had come to sit for a couple of hours. He said, I was naturally more interested in what he looked like than what he said. So again, this kind of disavowal of, of politics. Um, I'll skip over some of the kind of the political backdrop, but anyway, the um, treaty negotiations uh, proper, if you like, begin in, um, in October, November, continue through to December 1921. And when the Irish delegates arrived, um, Hazel and John reached out. Um, Arthur Griffith um, was painted actually earlier in the year uh, alongside De Valera, or not, not physically alongside De Valera, but uh, at the same time uh, when they were there for the truce negotiations. And then um, portraits of Eamon Duggan, George Gavin Duffy and Robert Barton uh, were secured in those kind of uh, few weeks that they were present in London. And uh, at the same, that time, he also painted Michael Collins. That painting was, was, was subsequently lost. And the painting on the left is a kind of a, I guess, a kind of an infill, if you like, or it's, it's a, bit, a bit harsh, but a painting that Lavery painted later on, posthumously after, after Collins' death, to, to complete the set, if you like, before he gave them to the Hugh Lane Gallery in uh, 1935. And the portraits of um, Collins and Griffith were published as, as lithographs, which circulated quite widely in, in Ireland. They were advertised as national pictures. Um, and so this very much helps to kind of establish his, his reputation, as does the um, works like Michael Collins' Love of Ireland, which he um, paints uh, when, when Collins is lying in state. And as, as Roisin said, that also circulated um, I think it's very interesting. Some of these works become very much iconic in the kind of the visual culture of the Free State, even though Lavery um, never lived in Dublin, uh, was only a kind of an occasional visitor, and yet he sort of maintained from London this um, this presence in the in the Irish imagination. The um, so the painting uh, of. Love of Ireland was um, exhibited in the Salon d'Auton in Paris in November 1922, when it was reported that it would be, that it would come to Ireland as a gift to the nation. So, um, well, that didn't happen for some time. It, it was clear from the outset that these works were intended for a kind of a, a, a public um, public institution in uh, in Ireland. Paintings of the British delegates followed as they were in London and would have been more accessible to Lavery, so there wasn't the time pressure, although, as you see there, the picture of Austin Chamberlain was never finished. Uh, so he completed paintings of Birkenhead Chamberlain uh, and Lloyd George. Winston Churchill he'd previously painted. They were good friends and painting companions. Um, and... Um, I was going to talk a little bit about the, the kind of exhibition of these works and their reception. So hence this, this is uh, Hazel, Hazel with um, her portrait of John and an exhibition that they held in 1921 20, during the treaty negotiations. But I think in the interest of time, I'll, I'll skip that and um, head more to the donation. Early on, um, before he kind of began the, the treaty portrait series, he really uh, I think had an, a notion that he would paint a kind of a history painting of a group of men seated around a table, maybe something like um, one of his his uh, war commissions, um, this kind of uh, slightly sort of staged moment in history. That didn't come to pass um, in, in terms of the Irish treaty uh, paintings, but he did complete a painting in the House of Lords, uh, which eventually was purchased by the city of Glasgow, the city in which he began his career. So in the 1920s, uh, this group of paintings um, 
nine treaty portraits, but also other, other kind of Irish subjects, uh, paintings of George Bernard Shaw, John McCormack, uh, landscapes, sat in his studio kind of waiting uh, for a home. And there was um, considerable kind of negotiations throughout the 1920, particularly with Thomas Bodkin, who was then uh, director of the National Gallery of Ireland. And it's a little bit unclear, I think, sometimes as to whether the gift was intended to uh, to go to the government, the state, the National Gallery, or is the National Gallery a kind of a, a, a sort of a stand-in or a symbol of, of the state? Um, but various sensitivities precluded that from happening, uh, particularly um, the portrait of Lord Birkenhead was um, seen to be contentious. Um, and Bodkin wrote to President Cosgrave, uh, I feel that it would not be proper to hang them all until a considerable time has elapsed. A few of them would be undoubtedly would undoubtedly excite such feeling as might endanger their safety. Um, and Lavery actually was also particularly concerned with the conditions in which they were to be displayed. He wanted a modern top-lit gallery, so it wasn't just a, a question of politics. He wanted them to be shown in literally the, the right light, and he was quite exercised about uh, actually about the quality of lighting in the Elster Museum after he gave a gift there, and also the, the Municipal Gallery of Modern Art when we built a new building in 1933. He didn't approve of the lighting there either, but uh, they did have top-lit galleries. Um, so uh, it, it presented an opportunity or a, a kind of a space uh, for the gift. Um, I think one interesting thing in all the correspondence around the gift in the 1920s um, is this kind of uh, sidestepping of the, the works as political. And there's an emphasis on there being his, historic, having historic and artistic significance. Um, Hazel wrote to Bodkin that John does not wish the gift to have anything other than an artistic and historical significance, and those words are underlined. Um, and later, Cosgrave wrote to Hazel, Sir John's munificent gift is, of course, above all party considerations. It is both historic and artistic. So I think this is a kind of a, a strategy to sometimes, and I think we maybe use it today as well, that you kind of construct the idea of art as something that is apolitical and safe, and that maybe en enables it to be kind of insinuated into contexts where another might not be uh, so read read readily welcomed. Um, so anyway, the, the gift of the National Gallery to the state didn't happen in the 1920s, partly because of various political sensitivities. Um, and after Hazel's death, uh, the works, um, 34 in total, were given to the Municipal Gallery of Modern Art in the memory of Hazel Lavery. Um, Prior to that, in 1929, actually, John had given a group of paintings to the Elster Museum, and this is some of them when they were hanging in the Hulane Gallery a few years ago, uh, also 34 works. And you see throughout, they're very conscious about um, the kind of perception of the, the two gifts and that they are, um, that they are kind, of, kind of equivalent. And there's even some uh, concern from Hazel's part that um, Dublin shouldn't be offended that, that Belfast got theirs first. It was simply a case that the new Belfast Art Gallery had been constructed and there was an opportunity there to, uh, to send them to, to Belfast. Um, so when they uh, finally came to Dublin, and these are, you probably, you, can't read those. But these are some of the notes from the curator at the time, John J. Reynolds, um, about the kind of hanging arrangements. And there was quite a, a long, um, I think, or kind of conversation with Lavery, who was also involved with how the works would be displayed. They were exhibited in the room that had been left empty for the Lane Bequest paintings. So at this point, the room, the building had only been um, open two years. And two years after this, um, this empty room, which was intended to house the, the Lane Bequest paintings then in, in London, uh, was given over to Lavery's Bequest, which I think is, um, you know, shows the kind of status with which they were accorded. Okay. The freedom of the city of Dublin was conferred on Lavery at a reception in City Hall in September 1935. 
and in his speech he paid tribute to Hazel, who had encouraged him to do something for Ireland. He said, I found it difficult because I was a portrait painter, and patriotism and paint are very hard to amalgamate. I was naturally very anxious to be considered an Irishman, although in London, where I frequently had to tell them I was an Irishman, they said, oh yes, from Glasgow. <laughs> Arguably, it was Lavery's complex personal history, I think, and identity, along with his res resourcefulness, that enabled him to na navigate the, the different social spheres in Glasgow, London, and Dublin. Um, and in order to progress and then to maintain a very successful career over many decades. And I guess this, yeah, this question of the gift that, that we was just touched on. Um, uh, so, so in one, le one sense, you know, Lavery's gift is a hugely generous donation uh, for the city, but I do think he was aware of his, con of his legacy as an artist um, for which he wanted to maintain credibility. Um, sometimes he was criticised in his lifetime for flattering sitters at the expense of his artistic integrity. And he himself uh, expressed shame at having spent my life trying to please sitters and make friends instead of telling the truth and making enemies. So I think, in part, these, these kind of um, independent projects uh, to kind of to c construct this body of work around, particularly around Irish history, um, uh, maybe help to kind of um, allay those concerns. As I mentioned, works such as Blessing of the Colours, um, Michael Collins' Love of Ireland became quite iconic, I think, in the, in, the, um, uh, in the years following the foundation of the Free State. And perhaps they filled in some ways a kind of a void because of the lack of commissioning that Roshan was talking about this morning. Um, Sean Keating had tried to get funding to, to create a kind of a, 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 you know, a, a series of portraits, but that was denied him. Whereas I guess Lavery had the means to uh, undertake this kind of personal project. Um, although I would uh, point you to the studio and state catalog and to Fintan Cullen's essay, uh, in which he kind of critiques the idea of Lavery as a, a national artist. Um, nonetheless, um, his treaty portraits are among a significant, uh, I think, group of works that Lavery, conscious, conscious of his own legacy and reputation as an artist, wanted to create something of significance. And Hazel was also very important uh, uh, in, in kind of managing that. OK, last, last bit. Um, back in 1915, Lavery was quoted as saying, my pictures are the only opinions I profess. And uh, he was often incredibly kind of self-effacing regarding politics. And actually, the more you look at the archive or the more you read his statements, the kind of less of an answer you really get as to his motivations. And I was thinking this week that he almost had, uh, he was almost like he was thinking ahead to the kind of decade of commemorations or the decade of centenaries because um, they've, they've been incredibly kind of useful, I guess, um, for us in this time. Uh, and that's a little bit flippant, but at the same time, I think he was acutely aware of the role that images play in the construction of histories. Um, and he was conscious of the role that these images and these works could play into the future. He bided his time uh, in kind of uh, negotiating the gift to Dublin and uh, secured, and to Belfast, so and ultimately secured two significant donations, um, enabling his, what essentially his kind of private endeavours to become, uh, or to embody public narratives. I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you very much, um, Logan. And um, I look, look forward to talking more about that then, um, about Lavery, the enigmatic um, Mr. Lavery uh, at the end of the session. Just to remind you, I forgot to say uh, at the beginning that Hannah Smith will not paper has been cancelled because unfortunately she is ill and unable to attend. So we'll, we're going to move on to the next speaker who is Stephen Pagani. And Stephen Pagani um, is Emeritus Professor in the School of Law at the University of Warwick. He now lives in Budapest in Hungary, um, the city of his birth. He has um, lectured widely in his career in law in, in various universities in the UK, in Budapest and at the University of Connecticut. Um, and he has published um, many books as well, Human Rights in Eastern Europe, Writing Wrongs in Eastern Europe, 
the Roma Cafe, Human Rights and the Plight of the Roma People, and Modern Times, the, bio the Biography of a Hungarian Jewish Family, published just um, in 2021. And Stephen's going to talk to us today about competing narratives of self-determination in Transylvania after World War I, the life and times of Janusz Thorma. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Okay, well, I, I fear that this paper may disappoint uh, because I, I won't be talking um, about vampires. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to write a... Yeah, okay. Um, but the, the book I, I've sort of embarked on um, is about Transylvania. And I think in order to ensure that sales uh, at least go into three figures, I'll, I'll have to have a generous section um, on, on vampires. Um, okay. Uh, so I, I, the notes that I sent in, I... Uh, I sort of ditched and rewrote the thing this morning. So anyway, hope I can find my way through it. Um, that's uh, Torma, Janusz Torma, uh, a self-painting. The life and career of the Transylvanian Hungarian artist Janusz Torma was shaped by the parallel of mutually conflicting demands for self-determination of two peoples, Hungarians and Romanians. Born in April 1870 into an impecunious family of Hungarian gentry, just three years after the Habsburg Empire had reinvented itself as Austria-Hungary, Tormak grew up in a social environment in which memories of Hungary's bid to free itself from Habsburg rule in 1848-49 continued to exert uh, an almost all-pervasive influence. Hungarian forces had been overwhelmed. The nation's revolutionary leader, Lajos Kossuth, had fled into exile. But Hungarians were proud of what they had accomplished. Over the course of 18 months, Habsburg armies suffered a succession of humiliating defeats at the hands of the Hungarian rebels. And if the Russian Tsar had not dispatched 200,000 troops and supporting artillery to quell the revolt, uh, following an appeal from his fellow emperor, Hungary may well have triumphed. The 1848 revolt against Habsburg rule and the bloody retribution that followed in its wake uh, feature prominently in Torma's art, particularly in perhaps his two most celebrated uh, oil paintings. Well, ce celebrated in the Hungarian-speaking world, at least. The first of these, completed in 1896, when Torma was in his mid-twenties, depicts the execution that's the, the one on your left, yeah. The execution in the town of Orod uh, of 13 high-ranking Hungarian army officers who'd taken part in the uh, insurrection. The painting, The Martyrs of Orod, turned Torma uh, into a national celebrity. According to one account, no exhibition of paintings in Budapest um, had ever aroused so much interest. And if if you look at the painting, it was uh, designed to be have great emotive force. And okay, some of it's missing. Okay, you, in addition to looking at it, you have to imagine the bit that somehow got excluded on the left, which is of the uh, the execution by hanging um, of one of the martyrs. In fact, all but I think two of the martyrs were executed by hanging, which was a deliberately uh, demeaning act uh, uh, ordered by the um, uh, ordered by the Habsburgs. The the Austrian generals. Um, uh, okay, so I'm afraid uh, part of it is missing. Um, where are we? Page six. If you look at the painting, um, it has great emotional appeal, but as an evocation of a specific period in history, the martyrs of Orod distorts as much as it, as much as it illuminates. By invoking God and the Holy Scriptures, there are no fewer than five priests in attendance at the martyr's execution, one of whom is kneeling before 
Uh, the figure in the cart, is that visible? No? Okay. Uh, never mind. Um, uh, Torma ignores the fact that the Hungarian rebels were not fighting for abstract notions of justice or for the liberation of all subject peoples, while pursuing emancipation for Hungarians by all possible means, the rebels were intent on denying equivalent or even more limited freedoms to the other nations settled within in the borders um, of historic, uh, historic Hungary. Uh, Torma worked intermittently on a second historical canvas, Tolpra, Magyar, Arise Hungarians. I think most of that, uh, most of that is, it does feature there. Uh, he worked on that uh, for decades. Uh, intermittently, uh, sometimes quite intensively. He was never satisfied with the painting and he only stopped working on it a matter of months uh, before his death uh, in 1937. Um, yeah. uh, while the Martyrs of Orod focuses, that's this one, focuses on the tragic aftermath of Hungary's bid for independence in 1848, Arise Hungarians immortalizes or tries to immortalize an event that is supposed to have occurred at the very beginning of the revolt. Uh, the painting depicts the dashing uh, young poet Sándor Petrofi, uh, who became the, the very embodiment or literary embodiment uh, of the revolution, uh, reciting his Nemzeti Dol or national song to an ecstatic Hungarian crowd gathered in front of the National Museum uh, in Pest uh, on 15th March 1848. Uh, in fact, historians now doubt whether, in fact, uh, Petofi did recite uh, uh, this poem on that particular occasion at that particular time. But nevertheless, uh, the image uh, has great uh, historical uh, resonance. Uh, go to page eight. Okay, right. In Tormos painting, uh, the huge Hungarian crowd, it's actually bigger, but anyway, uh, the huge, you have to imagine it, uh, the huge Hungarian crowd represents the Hungarian nation in all its diversity, united in patriotic fervor, young and old, women as well as men, rich and poor, a shepherd on the left uh, in an astrakhan hat, the hat's missing, um, and a woolen coke, uh, as well as besuited city dwellers are animated by a common cause, the freedom and independence of the Magyar, the Hungarian nation. Yet, by focusing on the Hungarian quest for self-determination, Torma inevitably ignores revolutionary developments elsewhere in Europe during this period, um, as, well as, as well as the efforts of national minorities within historic Hungary, Serbs, Romanians, Slovaks, etc., to secure enhanced recognition and freedoms. Unlike a novel, which can engage with several themes and topics, a painting necessarily has a much narrower focus. However, this did not pose a problem for Torma, whose empathy and emotional engagement were reserved exclusively uh, for his fellow Hungarians. Page three. Okay. Tordma, who spent most of his life in Nojbanya, now the Romanian municipality of Bayamare, should have understood better than most that the lands claimed by the Hungarian crown accommodated a patchwork of national and ethnic groups, including Serbs, Croats, Slovaks, Ruthenians and Romanians. According to a census conducted by the Hungarian authorities in 1910, only 54.4% of those living in Hungary gave Hungarian as their mother tongue, suggesting that almost half the population belonged to a national or ethnic minority. Um, in Transylvania, something like 23% uh, of the population were Hungarian. Uh, and that's according to official Hungarian statistics. So in reality,
reality, the proportion of ethnic Hungarians uh, was likely to have been smaller. Torma moved to Nagybanya at the age of 14 with his parents after his father had been offered employment as a tax official. Located on the fringes of historic Transylvania, the population of Nagybanya consisted predominantly of persons identifying as Hungarians with smaller numbers of Romanians and Germans, but in the surrounding countryside, and this is uh, uh, and remains um, uh, a heavily rural area, in the surrounding countryside, most of the inhabitants self-identified as Romanian. To the north, in Maramoros County, Hungarians were strongly represented in those few towns um, in that particular county, but the rural population comprised chiefly Romanians and Ruth, uh, Ruthenians. Nodbanya, where Torma spent most of his life, lay at the heart of a richly heterogeneous region in which several national, ethnic and religious groups had coexisted uh, for centuries. If Tordma's art was deeply influenced by Hungary's struggle for independence, particularly the failed revolt against ha Habsburg rule, his private and professional life in the town of Nodbanya was also profoundly affected uh, by the demands um, uh, of Romanians in uh, Transylvania and neighboring territories for unification with Romania after World War I. Following decisions taken by the Allied powers at the P Paris Peace Conference, based on the emerging principle of self-determination, Hungary was forced to cede Transylvania and other territories, including uh, uh, Maromoros um, and uh, Bayamare uh, to Romania in 1920. Torma resolved to remain in Nagybanya after its incorporation into Romania. Although conscious, acutely conscious, of the potential difficulties of his new status as an ethnic Hungarian uh, living in Romania, Torma was deeply attached to the town, nor could he countenance shirking his responsibilities towards uh, Nodbanya's art school, which he had led since 1917. And indeed, Torma had been one of the founding members uh, uh, of that school uh, and of an artist colony established uh, in Nodbanya um, in 1896, and in fact, historically, uh, uh, that, uh, that was and remains the most important uh, Hungarian artist colony um, ever to have been um, established. Okay, my conclusion, uh, which may not appeal to everyone, but anyway. Um, Tormas, both Torma's life and art illustrate the immense difficulties involved in implementing the principle of self-determination in territories where two or more national or ethnic groups have been settled for generations or centuries, often living in close proximity to one another. Self-determination for one national group almost always entails the denial of self-determination for another. Within Austria-Hungary, Hungarians ruled, sometimes uh, uh, with heavy-handedly, over substantial populations of Romanians, Slovaks, Serbs, Ruthenes, Croats, and others. Following the dissolution of Austria-Hungary and territorial changes imposed by the Allied powers at the Paris Peace Conference, millions of ethnic Hungarians were forced to accept minority status in Czechoslovakia, Romania, and in what became Yugoslavia, but was then known as the Kingdom of the Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes. In middle age, Torma had to come to terms with the fact that he was no longer a Hungarian living in the Transylvanian region of Hungary, but a citizen of, a, a citizen of Romania and a member of the Hungarian minority in Romania. For the most part, 
neither Romanians living in Hungary during the dual monarchy nor Hungarians living in Romania since 1920 have felt that their rights and interests have been adequately protected. Like most Hungarians of his day, Torma was a passionate nationalist. However, history, particularly history of the 20th century, may alert us to nationalism's inherent dangers. Nationalism and the creation of nation states that frequently, not always, uh, that frequently contain national, ethnic or other minorities has not, in the view of many historians, cured intolerance and inhumanity. According to some writers, nationalism may even have aggravated these tendencies. That certainly appears to have been the case um, in much of Central and Eastern and Southeastern Europe. Accepting and even celebrating diversity, along with the sheer complexity of personal identities, may offer, okay, I'll get the, okay, here, yeah, my hero. Uh, accepting and even celebrating diversity, along with the sheer complexity of personal identities, may offer an attractive alternative to the pursuit of national exclusivity and one grounded in empirical reality rather than uh, abstract ideology. As Amartya Sen has argued, defining people in terms of a single overriding characteristic such as national identity is misconceived. And to quote Sen, another quote from the one there, a shorter one, Sen says, Sen says this, the intricacies of plural groups and multiple loyalties are obliterated by seeing each person uh, as firmly embedded in exactly one affiliation, replacing the richness of leading an abundant human life with the formulaic narrowness of insisting that any person is situated in just one organic pack. To accept what Amartya Sen and others are saying entails a reimagination of nationalism and of national self-determination, one that can accommodate this broader, uh, more generous understanding. Uh, concepts such as civic nationalism and Habermas's notion of constitutional uh, patriotism uh, may perhaps show us the way to a brighter, more more peaceful uh, and more civilized future. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Stephen. Um, our next um, speaker and the final speaker in this session is Varvara Shavrova. Um, Varvara is a visual artist, curator, educator and researcher. She was born in the Soviet Union um, and she lives now between London, Dublin and Berlin. Um, uh, she, is she is exhibited internationally, including in Beijing um, and the Venice Biennale of Architecture, the Gallery of Photography in Ireland, um, in Tenerife, in the Beijing Art Museum of Imperial City, um, and in um, the Moscow Museum of Modern Art. Um, and she is going to speak to us today about Lithuanian artistic and cultural struggle for self-determination as a symbol made relevant by Putin's war in Ukraine. So, Barbara. Um, very good to be here. Um, thank you for your kind invitation and um, great to see some familiar faces um, and to be back. Um, so today um, I'm going to talk about the um, Lithuanian um, artists and uh, um, cultural workers struggle for self-determination as a symbol made relevant by Putin's war in Ukraine. And um, 
to start, I would like to say um, the reasons behind this research. Um, the reason for choosing to research the artistic and cultural struggle for self-determination in Lithuania stem partly from my familial links to, the, to that country. First, my surname at birth was Kedan, um, a name derived from a small town in central Lithuania that was once home to my ancestors, but which name was assigned to them only once they had fled from that place. Secondly, as a child growing up in Moscow with artist parents, um, I wanted to take a sentimental uh, journey back to the country where my father and mother had links with the Lithuanian artistic and um, activist community and visited there as a family in the Soviet times. <clears throat> Lastly, my visit was prompted by a sense of urgency in the context of the current war in Ukraine, a crisis that has stirred up so many nightmares of colonization and past oppression in all the Baltic states, a battle for freedom that I had thought was won back in 1991, but that now threatens to recommence. This combination of reasons to conduct my research in Lithuania have led me to attempt an understanding of transgenerational trauma experienced by those that live in the direct shadow of different past events within the culture of their family or immediate community. Through personal and societal self-reflection and the commitment to processing, uh, to processing the difficult pasts um, that frame their experiences, I believe individuals and groups can strive towards achieving a true artistic <laughs> and cultural self-determination. Um, I have examined the conditions of the struggle for self-determination in the recent past, when Lithuania gained its independence from the Big Brother, the USSR, or the Union of the Soviet Socialist Republics, through a process of effective decolonization that was recognized as a fundamental human right. Self-determination can be seen as a phenomenon that is both personal, in the sense that it can be realized through individual uh, emancipation and the exercise of um, their free, independent and political voice and in the wider context of the communal sense of self that shared, uh, that shared will of an oppressed community or nation to be free, to collectively determine their place in the world. I'm, notic I'm noticing too now both these manifestations of self-determination are intrinsically interconnected with the meaning that signifies an, international, an internationality of individual free will across a community. Um, this context for the term self does not limit self-determination to an individual, but instead widens the cells of selfhood towards the mutual, the shared, the communal aspiration of freedom. Uh, my experience visiting Lithuania has also led me to pose a question whether the Lithuanian nation as a whole and Lithuanian artists and cultural activists in particular can fully exercise self-determination and avail themselves of their freedoms if the nation may not yet have fully addressed and processed the transgenerational trauma of its difficult pasts. So I'm interested to look at the practice and the expression of self-determination as is equivalent to individual artistic free will, as it has been, is, and could be exercised by Lithuanian artists and cultural activists, especially within the context of processing of its past traumas, the understanding of its value within the present, and the aspiration for its future. These are the three elements that I will focus on in this presentation, and I will start with a short introduction to my research practice. So, as some of you would have seen this work uh, probably online or maybe in real life, um, uh, you will recognize that in my practice, I excavate the layers of my family history through the processes of remembering, recalling, retracing, and reenacting stories. In engaging memory, nostalgia, and reflection, I create installations that make connections um, between historical and current narratives, between the archival and the present experience. I examine the symbols of power and authority 
whilst investigating their relationship to an individual. <coughs> Uh, the, the materials I employ to construct my installations comment on women's labour with methodologies of drawing, constructed textiles and digital imaging. In the installation In a Dream that we have just seen before, um, I work with the uh, actual real object that has been uh, created, uh, that has been designed by a member of my family, um, my great uncle, uh, and it was an amphibious plane that he managed to build in his communal apartment in St. Petersburg in the 30s, um, which is an apocryphic story, but it's true. Uh, the amphibious flying boat, Shavrov um, SH-1 and SH-2, um, it was um, made into obviously a machine of uh, military might. And what I make out of this is a carpet, is a, is a work that is softened, that has become almost like a domestic object. Um, deconstructed carpet representation of a military machine is intended to evoke the collapse of the Soviet dream world, um, challenging the militaristic symbolism of masculinity and power vested in flying machines. In my work on um, flight in the dialectics of a now dissolved Soviet revolutionary future um, and the vision of an anthropogenic post-future, the private dream of flying, and the visions, um, pardon, and the collective iconography of, of aerospace and mat are materialized through an absorption of historical and archival material into an expression of the present moment. So um, this is the first image that um, I put on my social media when the war in Ukraine has started. And look at it, looking at it now, I recognize that it was an, intu an intuitive and also a highly emotional and personal response to the declaration of war. Because I myself, like so many other uh, Russians opposing the war, felt the impulse to post photographs of my relatives, my family members who come from both countries, Russia and Ukraine, and whose ancestors uh, came from Lithuania, and who have exhibited their determination by fleeing from the countries of birth and the countries where they're of their origin, becoming migrants and immigrants, fleeing to other countries for safety, fleeing the invasion, poverty and death. So I will say a few words about um, Lithuanian political and cultural business leaders are gravely concerned not only for the fate of ordinary Ukrainians who have been needlessly dying since the war started, but also for their own safety in the context of the bloody history of Soviet annexation in the Baltic states. Essentially, their, col their colonized past, their present political affiliation with the European Union and NATO, and their geographical proximity to their would-be oppressor. Artists and cultural workers in Lithuania are alarmed and are working on projects that reflect their determination to retain their independence and oppose Russian military posturing. These projects are evidence of uh, they are evidencing self-determination without fear of oppressive censorship or political interference in artistic self-expression. So, for example, these works were uh, shown in uh, Churlonis Museum in Kaunas. And this is a project that started, I think, in the first days of the war by the group of Lithuanian artists. And they refer to the kind of the agit prop medium of poster art with the intention to show solidarity with the artists and humans in Ukraine. And I'm showing some of uh, my own works, which I've made also in the first days of war. Um, what we're missing here is an amazing sound. Um, and this is another sort of military flying object. In this case, a prototype of a drone um, based on a first flying machine invented um, or fancied, not quite invented, by Vladimir Tatlin. So I call this work Tatlin's Drone. It's made in Ukrainian colors. and. What was interesting when I was showing it, I turned it into a pillow. So this is outside of um, Royal College where I'm doing the PhD. But when I was showing this work, the sound of the stitching 
was playing in the headphones and people who saw the exhibition, they said, well, this sounds really quite menacing, like the, the sound of uh, maybe gunshots, but actually it's just a sewing machine. So it's kind of an interesting iteration of, or, or uh, feminization, if you like, of the object, uh, the flying object of the war. Um, historically, Lithuania suffered from prolonged periods of subjugation by powerful neighbors. The country was absorbed into larger neighboring states, Poland, Imperial Russia in the 19th century, and more recently by the Soviet Union. The annexation of Lithuania by the USSR occurred in the 1940s during the Second World War, when Stalin's son was brought to shine on Lithuania, um, followed by mass terror repression and suppression of independent self-expression. Lithuania and the other Baltic states were forcefully made to join the Soviet Brotherhood um, of Nations, where it remained for 50 years until the collapse of the Soviet Union in 91. <clears throat> and I use uh, uh, this slide to illustrate um, an interesting juxtaposition, which I came across when I was doing my research in Lithuania um, at the exhibition um, uh, of works in the National Gallery of Lithuania, and th this particular piece is by a contemporary artist, um, Lima Kravitis, and what, what she makes, um, the, the dynamics are very interesting. She makes the proposition about a historic painting, which we see on the left, of um, a historic figure, a poet, Salome Neris, who basically was um, enlisted to bring Stalin's son to um, Lithuania. She was commissioned or maybe more likely forced to write a poem that glorified Stalin and then eventually, of course, regretted that. And then there is a kind of myth that, that, that she might have written a confessional, a black diary that um, may or may not exist or have existed. And so the artist in the context of today has created an installation whereby she kind of promotes the idea of the black book possibly existing and juxtaposes her work, which is the video piece on the left, um, with the historic painting of Salome uh, Maris, uh, Neris's action of bringing Stalin's son to, to Lithuania. Um, in the late 70s, the Soviet Union and its government held a repressive grip on all its citizens. Anyone who dared to express their self-determination and contradicted or deviated from the party line were brutally repressed, incarcerated, and often forcefully admitted to psychiatric treatment, in inverted commas. For example, the Helsinki Human Rights Group, led by esteemed Soviet scientist Andrei Sakharov and his wife Yelena Bonner, could only exist in the deep of the political underground. <clears throat> the artists and writers who declared or, or who dared to contravene the official ideology of the Soviet socialist realism and communist morality were arrested and often tortured by the KGB agents and often exiled from the country um, to erode their capacity to act in unison. The examples include celebrated poet Nobel laureate Josef Brodsky, um, artist Yuri Kupe, Vadim Zakharov, um, and many others. Um, I'm sure some of the names would be familiar. Um, the KGB was always particularly zealous in suppressing political dissent in the Baltic states. Following the Soviet occupation in the 1940s, 130,000 Lithuanians, 60,000 Estonians and 30,000 Latvians were sent to the Soviet Gulag. So you can imagine the memories of the Soviet occupation are less than, less than positive. Um, Lithuanian artists have been politically active, especially in the 70s, 80s and 90s. Um, at the time when my father, for example, would often travel to visit Lithuanian artist friends, and despite the ever-present eye and ear of the KGB, Lithuania, Lithuania was still a freer place um, than Moscow was. Uh, my father formed lifelong friendships with many esteemed and now well-established and uh, revered Lithuanian artists, writers, art historians, curators, and cultural activists. Um, the art from that time uh, used the so-called Aesopian language. So um, talking about the meaning between the lines, um, and then somehow that was more allowed in Lithuania than it was in the Soviet Union um, 
proper as in the Moscow and, and Leningrad. Um, between 1980 and 1990, uh, Lithuanian artists remained self-determined and exercised their independence much more effectively and persistently than the artists in the Soviet Russia by making non-conformist, non-official art, retaining basic levels of independent creative expression and developing a distinctive, is open language of metaphors that hid criticism of the Soviet regime. Um, these artists, many of whom actually were friends of my father, were political activists participating in mass demonstrations, openly opposing the Soviet regime, including organizing and taking part in the now legendary Baltic Way. And I just want to show you this photograph. Um, this is a legendary event that um, I think uh, one can say visually symbolizes um, the events um, of the separation of the Baltic states from the Soviet Union. Um, it's uh, the, the event that took place in 1991 uh, when thousands of people, ordinary uh, citizens of Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia joined hands and organized themselves in a peaceful protest, a peaceful demonstration of unity that stretched across three countries. And the record of this, the, I, I find the imagery of this is very different to the imagery of uh, protest that we see, of course, taking place today. Um, the protests were uh, also uh, difficult that there were people that were killed um, by the uh, Soviet forces. Um, there were funerals of the heroes, and then, of course, uh, that was followed by the deposition of the statues of power, the statues of Lenin. And observing that from Moscow was incredible because um, it was unparalleled and it was very different. A way of organizing protest and also knowing that friends of my father, for example, were part of this. That they were inside those lines. Um, and I want to sort of move to the next part of my presentation. I hope I won't run out too much on, uh, out of time because it's already um, going very fast. But um, this image of, um, it's actually a monument to uh, cosmonautics, believe it or not, which is placed outside of the National Gallery of Lithuania, where the, the piece of uh, Salome and Eris and the contemporary artists that were reflecting on her life uh, is placed. And the interesting thing is that uh, it is a complex um, which to me uh, symbolizes and represents in so many ways the Soviet architecture style, but it has been changed by the repurposing. So originally built in late 80s to house the uh, Museum of the Revolution, which every uh, brother, brotherhood nation state had to have. This museum has been re repurposed and now is uh, housing the National Gallery. And also the symbol of the uh, cosmos is represented by a woman um, holding a, a flock of birds, which is very different to say the statues that even we saw in Yasmina's and other presentations showing those kind of hero mother um, with all kinds of sort of possibly threatening attributes in her hand. And so um, I will briefly go over the exhibition that um, to me it summarized in many ways and represented the uh, research that I was looking um, to achieve. Uh, in a way, curators did, did, did the work for me because they addressed all the questions that I was interested in. And um, uh, specifically, the artists that were shown in this exhibition um, represent the process of reassessment and the necessity to understand what difficult pasts mean and how they need to be processed today in order to achieve independence in order to achieve full freedom and in order to achieve understanding of self-determination. And so the, this work, for example, by um, one of the artists uh, represents precisely that shadow of the past, the shadow of the historic um, darkness that the building, uh, formerly the Museum of the Revolution, holds. And yet it proposes for 
um, the visitors to step over that path, literally, to step over the shadow and kind of carry away the, the difficult, uh, problematic, heavy burden. And other pieces like this, for example, showing the um, crystal ware that I suppose doesn't really associate with anything very threatening um, to normal people, but in the Soviet Union, those kind of objects were highly desirable and associated with um, possession of power, people who had the crystal. So she placed those objects very randomly in the museum that one could just walk across and um, possibly stumble. Um, and then these works very interesting as well. I mean, unfortunately, we don't have a huge amount of time to go over them, but um, they also challenge the, the, the past histories and specifically the representation of the um, Jewish communities, the Jewish women in uh, the struggle for independence, um, the Ukrainian artists who work with the ideas of um, saving food, the impossibility of throwing food away and recalling uh, their grandparents' memories of Holodomor, um, the starvation. And finally, this piece, which for me uh, held particularly strong resonance because it talked about the Afghan war. And uh, the artist is based in Latvia, a Russian-speaking Latvian, who basically talks to her father, who was in the Afghan war and who to this day hasn't really met the uh, shadows of his past. Um, and finally, I will very quickly go through the surprised element of my research, which I, I knew that will happen, but I wasn't sure what form it will take. Um, and in a way, it's, it's interesting because uh, it, it went back to me looking for my family roots and looking for the lost surname. Because even today, I was introduced as Vavara Shavrova, which is the name uh, that, that belongs to my mother. The Kedan part of my surname was missed. And uh, it happens all the time because this is a new acquisition, if you like. Um, I only recently found the possibility of reclaiming my father's surname. And that trip to Lithuania, in a way, helped the process and it helped to find uh, the lost roots. Um, these are the surnames of the people who lived in Lithuania at some point. Um, they lived in a town called Kedan, a small town where historically the population of Ashkenazi Jews amounted to almost half, in addition to local Lithuanians and Poles. Originally invited to Lithuania by Radzivila dukes in the 17th century, the Jewry of Kedan thrived there for over 200 years, establishing religious schools, markets, engaging in tailoring and weaving goldsmith, goldsmithing, clockmaking, um, running pharmacies, vodka distilleries and banks. Uh, Kedan's Jewry contributed significantly to the local economy, whilst remaining other as the Jewish community weren't able or encouraged to blend with non-Jewish communities except for employing Lithuanian workers. And my ancestors continued living in Kedan until the late 17th century, when the first anti-Jewish sentiments started brewing across Eastern Europe, followed by the violent pogroms in the late 19th, early 20th century that made our family members, who were likely to have been wealthy gold merchants, merchants to flee, first to Ukraine and then to Russia. They arrived to their destination with nothing, um, having, having fled their homes, leaving their jobs and often their entire life savings behind. They arrived nameless, as the old traditional Jewish, uh, Jewish communities did not use surnames. And that is how our family name came to be. We were named after the town where we were invited to settle, where we had thrived, and from where my ancestors were expelled. So my journey to Kedane was naturally not as traumatic um, as the flight of my ancestors from the town, nor could it compare with the tragic events on August 28, 1941, when 2,076 members of the Jewish community were rounded up and executed by a firing squad near the Smilgar River that ran through the center of the little town. The local guidebook notes, after the war, only a handful of Jewish families lived in Kedane, 
Some of the offsprings left the city, others created new families, stayed on and became more like Lithuanians. It appears that the othering continues even after 80 years. And so the sad findings of my trip, that's by the way is the site where this uh, tragic event took place. Um, the sad findings of my field trip left me more than certain that the phenomenology of transgenerational trauma indeed exists. Um, and when one is exposed to its trigger, in the case of Kedainai, when I visited the place that advertised itself as one of the oldest Lithuanian towns, whose architecture and history is still preserved in its walls, the lack of acknowledgement of the past crimes, it became physically overwhelming and oppressively hard to cope. And what I found in Kedainai was precisely nothing. Nothing that commemorated the tragic flight of the local jury, or the, se the senseless loss of life at the hands of local Lithuanian Nazi collaborators. This deafening silence crept under my skin and made me want to flee Kidaine, but it also made me experience a sense of what my fleeing ancestors may have felt two centuries ago, an animalistic fear of death, the entire lack of freedom, of will, and precious little scope for self-determination. I felt that I had glimpsed into a dark abyss of indifference, and I felt the cold hand of deadly silence. So you might want to say, how does this connect to the Lithuanian artist's strive for self-determination? And what has it to do with my research? Well, I think it has to do everything with this because it creates the question and it poses the void that I feel I will need to address in the next part of my research. And I would like to conclude with this image um, by William Kentridge, another um, artist of Lithuanian descent who was invited to Kaunas uh, to make work in response to very similar um, history. Um, and this, this piece is incredible because it is precisely full of that. It's full of silence. So to conclude, I will say that the research trip revealed a narrative of the power of popular resistance and resolve of communities to enjoy self-determination even in the face of seemingly insurmountable obstacles. It has also showed how the EU, as a model of political federation of nations, uh, federation enables nation states to coexist and thrive with self-determination enshrined into the constitution of their members. I am pleased to have dipped my toes into the vibrant artistic culture in Lithuania too, and can see that it is blossoming, and to re reacquaint myself with some of the names of the artist activists from the Soviet period, some of whom were friends and colleagues of my father. My father died almost 20 years ago, and so it was a very special and sentimental journey to meet with one of his oldest artist friends. However, Although my findings regarding the role of artistic community in the overthrow of the Soviet colonial system were heartwarming and something to feel deep pride in, it was more difficult to reconcile the feelings I experienced in attempting to trace my Jewish ancestry back to my namesake town of Kedan. I couldn't help but feel that my ancestor has repeatedly, over several centuries, been deprived of their right to self-determination and within the political and cultural system they lived in um, or lived alongside. Indeed, the awareness of their plight prompted me to rec recognize that self-determination does not necessarily mean independence in the geopolitical sense of a definitive territory, although it is often thought of as such. I recognize that my ancestors and the co-community were obliged to migrate to exercise their self-determination, or indeed to avoid persecution or death. In this context, we might see that all migrant refugees from wherever in the world they, they need to leave to find a better life are in fact attempting to exercise their own self-determination at both a personal level and as often occurs as a community or even a whole nation. Thank you. The sands of time are, are running fast. 
Um, and um, we are, we're going to set up for the final panel, but, but while this is happening, if anybody has any questions for the speakers, for the three speakers, um, would you? Now is the time, yeah. If anybody would like to ask anything. Yep. Opposite you anyway. Oh, um, <laughs> you said that Lavery didn't want himself described as a national artist, and that his his or, or did I understand you correctly there? And that his work was of a historic. The portraits were of a historical and artistic uh, genre, which of course portraiture was in contrast yeah. to mainly Janet and people who were doing more abstract work after that. But how do, I'm just someone who has curated his work and and thought about it so deeply. How would you understand? his position? Um, well, I guess that's what I was trying to figure out. So the, um, the reference to him being a national artist, the reference to him being a national artist actually was kind of applied to him, particularly by yeah. Shane Leslie. So um, it's not something he, that he claimed, I don't think, but the work kind of yes. took over a kind of a, 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 a an, suggested a kind of interpretation, so that, that came later. And the um, historical artistic significance is something that he and Hazel actually, often in the correspondence, it's her, it's uh, this kind of pushing aside any kind of political um, uh, intent. And, but I do, I mean, uh, I, yeah, politics. Um, <laughs> what, is, what is word. political? It's yeah. an ugly word. Yeah. What is politics? And, yeah, and what is political art? I, I think there was he was he was trying to obviously when you I think when you there's a political dimension to it and clearly he he backed the treaty. Um, yeah. They but at the same time he was very careful about this idea of parity equivalence, um, not kind of unduly upsetting one side or the other. So I think he he was very kind of skillful as a kind of a mm -hmm. ambassador or as a kind of a yeah. negotiator. I think there's one, yeah, is there one more? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah sure, I just wanted to ask a, a question for the, for the three speakers about the idea of self-determination, which in their different talks was understood less than the idea of nation states. And in their idea of uh, self-determination, is there, uh, do they have any ideas for different institutions which could help develop those, um, those ideas of self-determination? i.e. beyond museums which are nationally based. Does that make sense? I think that's a very tricky question. Yeah. <laughs> that's really mean. Um, yeah. Would I, either of you like to take that or very briefly? Yeah. Or oh, okay. Stephen, quick. Yeah. Oh, I'm stuck here again. This, uh, <laughs> good. Yeah. Don't know how, you don't have to get um, up. OK, I, my hearing's going. I, I didn't quite hear the, the last few words. but. Um, so I, I must admit, my uh, I, I, I sort of feel I'm one of the sort of intellectual or lesser intellectual heirs of uh, Joseph Roth. So, so self determination on the whole rather scares me and sort of get, gets me um, anxious. Um, so uh, clearly, there's a distinction between self determination and statehood. And from a legal point of view, in, in terms of international law, uh, self determination can be manifested um, in, in lesser forms of self-government or autonomy, um, or even linking up uh, with a, a kin state. Um, uh, so it doesn't necessarily have to amount to full sovereignty and statehood. In terms of institutions, I. I, I want to shy away from the, 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 the terminology, which carries an awful lot of baggage, I think, of self-determination. But clearly, uh, you mentioned institutions, and that, that raises all kinds of very interesting uh, possibilities and, and, and scenarios. And, um, uh, because, yeah, if you look at frameworks such as the European Union, the Council of Europe, other in, uh, international bodies, uh, they do encourage and to some degree facilitate 
uh, the preservation, the consolidation of cultural uh, and linguistic um, identities um, and do uh, favour and to some degree prioritise notions of pluralism. That's not necessarily the same thing as self-determination, but I think it raises uh, fewer anxieties. Yeah, we're, we're, thank you very much for that, for that answer. We just, I think we're going to draw a line under this session now. Um, we have to, to move on, but I could, could I ask you all to thank Bavara, Logan and Stephen for three wonderful papers and great contribution. Thank you very much.